I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture. It's a vital part of our year-long program of public events, and it's a pleasure to see friends from across campus, from across the school, and from the community at large. We're delighted to see you. This lecture would not have been possible without the enthusiastic support of many people, and I'd like to recognize and thank Peter Fleischmann and the Foundation of Jewish Philanthropies for their help and commitment, and Bob Skirka for his continued support for our school and ever-expanding interest in architecture and design. Thank you all very much indeed. It's very much appreciated. There are also uh, thanks that are due to faculty and students of the school's lecture committee um, and staff whose help is invaluable. Um, <laughs> To Joyce Wang and Corey Smith, the chairs of architecture, and to Dean Robert Shibley. And it would be impolite not to thank Daniel and Nina at this point, too. Their tolerance and patience in the face of extraordinary weather a few weeks ago, and their eagerness to find time to come to Buffalo and speak at our school anyway after the storms is very much appreciated. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's really like this all the time. Um, yeah. uh, Daniel Liebeskind is perhaps one of the most delightful yet difficult architects to introduce. His extraordinary commitment and contribution to architecture and the city, together with a worldwide reputation as a designer of significance and global standing, combine to make it a delight to introduce him. His notable achievements, which include the design and supervision and the construction of the Jewish Museum in Berlin, his vital role in the planning and redevelopment of the 9-11 site in New York City and the recently completed and very significant Holocaust Memorial in Ottawa are just three projects that combine to make a timeline of remarkable civic and cultural achievements. It is work that many of us here are familiar with and admire. But perhaps more difficult to introduce is the remarkable breadth of Daniel Liebeskin's work he was an accomplished and internationally recognized musician. Uh, this is for anybody in the audience and in the program who plays an instrument. Um, before he turned to architecture, and having once turned to architecture, he was to excel as a creative force, remarkable draftsman, and theorist. Daniel has a significant reputation as a teacher of architecture, and a reputation that's rooted in his own work and the innovative programs that he initiated in the school that he founded in Milan, directed at Cranbrook Academy for the Arts and pioneered in Germany. After winning the first prize in the competition to design an extension to the Berlin Museum in 1989, he was offered a senior fellowship in the Getty Museum in California. He was the first architect to receive such an award. However, he declined uh, that position in order to move to Berlin and to oversee the realization of the project for the Berlin Museum. So life is not always straightforward. Uh, but it, that building was his first major built work. Daniel Liebeskin continues to inspire in so many ways. However, I think he would be the first to agree that his work is rooted in deep and significant collaborations with his wife and partner, Nina. And we are thrilled that Nina was able to make time to be here with us tonight. We're delighted. <laughs> On behalf of all of our students, faculty and staff, I want to thank her so much for coming to Buffalo and recognize her tireless efforts and inspiration that is embedded in all of the work of Studio Liebeskind. I won't talk about the conversations in the car, but um, it was about all of the work of Studio Liebeskind. Um, on behalf of the University at Buffalo, our School of Architecture and Planning, and the wider communities across the city and the region, I most cordially welcome Daniel and Nina Liebeskind. Please join me in extending that welcome. Yes. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. It's, I'm delighted to be here without the snow. Uh, let me share with you, this is not really the typical lecture about buildings. Uh, it's really a journey across the creative process of how buildings are born, 
how they can be realized. And I call it the edge of order, edge of order. And if you think about it, that's the book. The book is, is a finely illustrated book with many different things. But it really deals with you know, what is architecture as I see it, not just as an architect making buildings. So this is the quote I start the book with. It's Paul Valéry, the great philosopher, French poet, who said that two dangers constantly threaten the world, order and disorder. And we can see it. Ordering the world, putting it to order, has it mar marching that order into the future. We can see the negative pole here, but also the pole of chaos. The, this order is also something negative, another pole. So how to navigate between these two, I would say evils, the evil of order, and we know how order has been used to order people, to order society, and we know the fatal results of that order. We also know the, the terrible things that happen w in, in anarchy and disorder. So navigation between these poles, that's really about architecture, and that's how I see the field itself. Now, this might seem obvious, that architecture is an art, but what kind of art is it? Well, we know it's a civic art. What is it based on? It's based on free thinking, the liberal arts. Of course, there is science involved, mathematics, but think about it. The liberal arts contain geometry, contain cosmology, the stars, poetry, tragedy, dance, philosophy. That's really the traditional basis of architecture. And I always think to myself that in arts, there is only one word, art. Everything is art. Take it as or leave it. It's art. But in architecture, we have two words. We have the word building and the word architecture. So you can have a building which is built, which is not a piece of architecture at all. You can have an architecture that has never been built, it's just in a drawing, but it is the art itself. So that's uh, really what the book is about. And I share with you some of the chapters, new language, which deals with how to create something through a language of architecture. Now, how to be an architect? Go to school, drafting tools, building codes, fashions of architecture? No. Travel and read books. Now, that's not me. That's a quote by one of the great architects of the 20th century, Le Corbusier. And even though I went to school, and I had an architecture education, and I even had drafting tools, uh, I see the point here that it's about the freedom of thinking, freedom to see other things, travel, Read a few books. He didn't say read a lot of books. Just read a couple of books, <laughs> but the right ones, just the right ones. So yes, that's really about that freedom that architecture is based on. Home. I don't know whether you can read this page. It's, 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 it's kind of blurred. It's difficult because we don't choose our home. We are born somewhere. We didn't choose it. We didn't even choose our parents. We're just born in that home. And that's kind of my experience as well because I was born as a matter of fact, I was born in a homeless shelter in Poland. My parents were survivors of the Holocaust. I grew up under communism, dictatorship. Poland had a Stalinist dictatorship. I grew up under antisemitism. I grew up under very adverse things. So that also forms your personality. And everybody, you know, everybody's work is formed by who they are, where do they come from, what is their home, what do they aspire to, and then this. We are not in Poland anymore. I was able to be really released, you know, by luck. The Polish authorities allowed Jews to leave Poland in the late 50s to Israel. And that's where I discovered color. That bleakness disappeared, freedom of society, liberty, beauty. And then I had my second paradise, which is, of course, New York. I was also an immigrant to the Bronx. So I had two sort of sets of, uh, of, of, fu of the future. Now, how did I you know, wh wh what, did, what did I do? Wh how d where did I come from? You know, I started my work by drawing. Now, I didn't have a client. And by the way, I tried to work for architects, for some famous ones. But I didn't last more than one or two days because I thought it was too boring. So, you know, I, I tried it. But I said, no, there must, must be another way to do architecture. So if you don't have a client, you don't have a budget, you don't have a social structure. You don't have, what do you do? You're not going to draw just fantasy castles. Uh, I thought, 
let's draw, let me draw what I think architecture really is. And all those lines and all those spaces and all those projections and collapsing projections are part of the way I discovered for myself. And that's kind of a radical step. Discover for yourself, not by what you've been taught by others, what architecture may be. Now think about it. Architecture is based on drawings. It has always been based on You couldn't even make this lectern here without a drawing. You need a drawing to produce a table, a chair, never mind a building or a city. And every line in the drawing is giving reality to something that cannot exist without that plan. So those are the drawings. There's the, the sense of three-dimensionality, two-dimensionality, and a kind of desire to create a language in which architecture can thrive. Later on, I created a, a different set of drawings. Uh, you know, it was through drawings, as I said, for many years. I really didn't have a job properly as an architect, but I thought drawings will lead me there. And I am a believer that, that drawings are really something almost divine, uh, inexplicable. When the nephew of, of Michelangelo, Antonio, asked his uncle, Michelangelo, what should I do, uncle? I want to be an architect. He said, don't apprentice yourself. Don't go and get a job. Draw, Antonio, draw. I don't know what happened to Antonio, but uh, his uncle gave him a good, <laughs> a good advice. These drawings, which I called chamber works, were based on my love for music, uh, but they are really architecture drawings. They're you know, very systematic, very much co you know, uh, disciplined in, in, in ways which are not obvious. And it is true that a drawing has its own destiny. Now, when I, you know, before I built any buildings, I would sometimes show these drawings. Many people would turn their heads and say, no, now you've, you're not an architect anymore. You, you're not doing architecture. But I, I was fully convinced that this was architecture. To me, this, this series, and it's a, it's a long series, there are, you know, 28 drawings, uh, which, which are highly constructed. Uh, and many students, when I showed this, you know, as a young architect in, in colleges and universities, said, did you take LSD to do this? Or did you, you know, what kind of drug? No, I, w I was doing architecture, but in, in a path that was not really conventional, shifting stones. This is about memory, because I consider that memory is really the ground of architecture. Really, it's not the real estate. It's not even the site as we so see it. It's what underlies the site, and what underlies it is memory. Think about it. Without memory, there would be absolutely nothing. We would not know who we are. As you see with people suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, their life is lost. They have lost that sense of what it is to be in this world. I call this chapter Shifting Stones, and I base it really on an experience of one of my favorite writers, Marcel Proust, a French writer, writing in the beginning of the 20th century, 1910, 1915, 1920s who wrote a magnificent opus, Remembrance of Things Past, you know, many volumes. But what does he say? He said that he was standing in the uh, Basil uh, Basilica of San Marco in Venice. He was a rich man. He was traveled widely, stood and stood on two uneven stones, suddenly realized that the ground was not completely straight under his feet, you know, as, as those old basilicas uh, are not perfectly straight. And when he experienced this sudden shock of, he remembered the exactly the same unevenness on the pavement of his little village in Iliès, you know, in, in France, in Normandy, where he used to go with his grandmother and grandfather as a little boy. And that experience suddenly brought back his childhood, his life, and his moment in Venice. And he decided that the task of his life was to record this memory as a revelatory thing, not just as a memory of personality, but as the memory of the world. So memory is a key to what I believe architecture really is. Now, this is a building, one of the first buildings I was able to, to build. Uh, it's the Felix Nussbaum Museum. Now, who is Felix Nussbaum? You know, when I started this project, and this was uh, a competition, I went to my 23-volume Encyclopedia Judaica, the Jewish Encyclopedia, 23 volumes. There was not an entry. And that's when I realized what the Holocaust really means. It's not about six million. We cannot fathom what that possibly means. That, but a single individual. Here is Felix Nova. This is his self-portrait with identity card. He was famous German painter, Jewish, 
but basically German. And as of 1933, his life took a dark turn. Nazis came to power. He escaped from various holding camps, escaped to France, es it was, was held in St. Cyprian, escaped to Belgium, where he still hid with his wife, Volka Platek, a Polish painter, painted his experience uh, uh, as of what was happening to him. And unfortunately, he didn't make it. He was uh, found out by his neighbors who smelled the turpentine in the attic of his house in Brussels, of his apartment, the apartment building where he lived. And he was unfortunately deported on the last train to Auschwitz to be murdered together with his wife. Then there is his painting, there is his identity card, and look at his eyes. That tells you really everything about what that memory really is and how to construct a building based on it. Now, I created a building that is really uh, fractured in many different ways. There's three different parts, very simple volumes. There is the bridge, there is the empty volume, there is the romantic wooden volume. So it, it's a kind of topography of his life. That's an aerial view. It's connected to the Kunsthistorisches Museum, that's a famous m you know, historical museum uh, of the city. And by the way, Osnabrück, near the Dutch border, is one of the oldest places in Germany. That's where Totenburg uh, Forest is. That's where Hitler thought Germans came from. That was the ethnic sort of epicenter. And the oldest coins uh, of Germany are in that building, the Dürer engravings. But I connected it in this uh, very radical building, which, as I said, is a topography of roots that, that end nowhere. And I call it actually in German museum on an Ausgang, a museum without an exit. Once you enter this museum, of course there are doors, you can leave the museum, but there's no exit from the experience of this particular life of Felix Nussbaum, the great painter, the painter lost in history, the painter deported, the painter murdered. So here it is, right behind the, the famous museum of Osnabrück, just in front of the walls where the Treaty of Westphalia was signed. Uh, here we have a uh, actually the narrowest uh, space I could build under German regulations. I wanted to build a space where the paintings are not like in a museum, but hang in a very narrow space. It's really two wheelchairs passing each other, ni 90 centimeters each, so a meter 80. The, the, the narrowest space I could possibly build. So that you don't look at his painting just as masterworks of art, but see how he saw them. He saw them in that proximity in his attic. And you can see the, w the wooden volume, which represents the old you know, romantic paintings before 1933. You can see the, the Nussbaum Gang, the w Nussbaum Walk, which is that narrow uh, slice of concrete, and the metal building, which is the bridge. And by the way, when I made this building, somebody said, what is the bridge? I said, that's a bridge for the unknown paintings of unknown Nussbaum. And they said, but we know. We have historians. We know everything there is to be known about him. And as a result of building this museum, strangely enough, two collections of paintings were given back to the Museum of Vaznabrok, collection from New York and from Tel Aviv, where his name had been erased during, uh, of course, those terrible years. So there it is, a, a building that is small, but tells that story and tells that shifting stone story, how, how this individual uh, is part of that world history, and you can see maybe on the on the edge there, on that on that sharp pointed wall, a painting of Roland Strauss's synagogue where he had his bar mitzvah, just exactly next to this building. So, it's a it's a building that that is kind of in a nutshell, uh, as, as Hamlet says somewhere. If I could be locked in a nutshell, I could really tell the story of the world in it. Uh, and there, uh, uh, luckily for me, I was able to build a new another building after many years after I finished the building because the audience has increased. When I built it, there was no cafe. There was no, you know, they thought, you know, it's a small building. We don't need these things. But luckily, I was able to build, and the museum is thriving and is moving forward in this small town. So past, present, and future, that triangle is an important one in my work. And memory, of course, of course is not only about old things, it's about new things. How do you create memory when you build a building? Now, this is really my first house. I never built a house. You know, why? No, because I lived my life in reverse. You know, most people start with, you know, with, with, with buildings, and, and then when they've sort of done a lot, they can relax and think about and in retro, uh, you know, reflect on what they've done. But I had time to reflect before I built anything, and now I really have to work hard. So it's a house. Uh, this is a house in Connecticut for a couple. You can see that it's a stainless steel, it's, it's monocoque construction. It's really a sculptured form that 
it really penetrates into the house. Uh, it's the house has many different colors depending of the angle which you which you ac access it. Uh, it's completely wood inside, so solid oak. Uh, my clients are art lovers. They are art experts. They have collections. But uh, their uh, brief to me was, we don't want to bring our art into uh, this house. We have it in New York and elsewhere. We want a house to inspire us. Ah, that's a heart assignment uh, to create a, an ambience, an intimacy, a domestic sense of life uh, with the means of architecture. Uh, and it's a, not a large house. But again, to create a sustainable house, well, it's almost a total work of art because they asked me to design everything, the furniture, even the sinks and the shower. And you can see that, you know, I don't like those taps, you know, those British Victorian silver things. So I was able to design this bronze sort of sculpture that, you know, is a line when you close it. And of course, the shower also without those curves and without those bad things that I, I never liked. Uh, and so again, the house has few openings, kind of almost porch-like. It's a sustainable building. Doesn't have, you know, glass, you know, large pa panes of glass. Uh, it's on a hill, this beautiful thing. And really, it's organized around the, the, the light, you know, in the winter and summer, wh where is the light and how to create really new memories for uh, for clients. And it's, you know, it's a small but dramatic structure. I always say uh, the only w m m mistake that I made, and one single mistake, uh, they gave Nina and myself a key to the house one weekend, said you can stay in the house for the weekend. <laughs> and we stayed, and then I never recovered because my wife said to me, like, why don't we have a house like this? <laughs> <laughs> the unobserved unicorn is another chapter uh, the unobserved unicorn is a Chinese idea. You know, the Chinese believe that we only see the white horses, but among the white horses are the unicorns, you know, that those special creatures. And they said, we, you have to be ready to see the unexpected, otherwise you'll just see the horses, you'll never see the unicorn. Uh, it's a beautiful thought, because in this case, it's about the sight. How do you discover a sight? It is like a unicorn. They all blend together like white horses, but the one with the horn is the one. So there's always something hidden in a site just waiting to be discovered. That's, that's true. There's always something hidden in a site just waiting to be discovered. And you can see that vertically, there's the unicorn, right? Just in the center of it. But we can skip over it easily because it's easier to read it that way. And that's kind of an illustration of a project here uh, you know, as I mentioned, I was born in Poland, and as I mentioned, Stalin, the dictator who, after the war, swallowed half of Europe, so-called Eastern, East Eastern Europe, Poland included, the dictatorship was, and he gave a gift to Poland. The gift to Poland was, first of all, the deaths that followed the German and the Nazi murders, but also the Soviet ones, and I was able to build a building across this gift. The gift was the Palace of Culture, which exists in Moscow, exists in many places. He put it as a stamp of oppression. And by the way, I remember as a boy with my parents, you know, w Warsaw was pretty destroyed in the late 40s, 50s. Uh, they completely wiped off the map. The Germans completely leveled it. The only building there was this symbol of, of oppression of, of the Polish people and of the Polish nation. Now, there I was able to build a, you know, a really a spectacular apartment building. It's not a cultural building. It's, it's just a residential tower. It happens to be the tallest one uh, in Europe right now. It's about 68 stories high. Uh, and it's a sculptured form that is just in front of the palace. It's, it's, and, it, and it in itself represents in its form. It's, it's a torqued wing-like form, which really is the wing of the Polish eagle that has been cut by the Soviets and cut by history. It's a, it's a dramatic building in an area which has really almost no, well, no, no residential uh, buildings at all because it was just wiped during the war and became kind of the center of the city in a sort of uh, 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 political way. But there is the building bringing life to the building and really pushing the Stalin building to the background. Uh, it's, it's a complex building. It, it has many different shapes and, and forms. It, it speaks to the city, and luckily for me, who speaks and reads Polish and, and is Polish, uh, this building has become the icon of, of Warsaw. 
You know, I was staying in a hotel in the Intercontinental next to it on their keychain, you know, the key card was the building. So people identified this building, even though it's just a, just a residential building, as something that gives new life to Poland. And true, when I came back to Poland after so many years, I saw a different country. It was not the country of darkness, of oppression, of fear. It was a country of liberty, country, a beautiful country of, of, of a new sense of what Poland has always wanted to be, but often not been given a chance. That's another chapter. It's about the sketch, the round corner table. And I have to tell you this story, because it's about the Formica table that I grew up in, in the Bronx. You know, we had only a two-room apartment. My sister and I slept in the bedroom. My parents were in the living room. We had a very small kitchen. We had a table, a Formica, sort of ungainly brown Formica table of that time. Uh, you know, after you know, finishing uh, supper, you know, I would clean the dishes, you know, wipe the table, and put my drawings on this table. But then to do my homework. Now, how do, how do you do homework? You had ink, you had pencils, you had a T-square. A T-square is a device that you put around at, at an edge of a table, if, as you know, and you slide it down. And I had, you know, very modernist exercises. I draw an axonometric of a, you know, brick wall, you know, with all the bricks. Very Miesian kind of exercise. But I had a problem because as I was sliding this T-square down the table, at what point is the curve beginning to deflect the line by a millimeter, by a point O of a millimeter, O one of a millimeter? You never knew. At some point, that line was no longer at a perfect right angle. And then I had my eureka moment. I realized, why is everyone obsessed with the right angle? since there are 359 others. And suddenly, I was able to use the T-square around the corner with great pleasure. By the way, uh, La Poème de la Langue Droite, uh, Le Corbusier's uh, mystical book called The Poem to the Right Angle. In that book, in this French master's thesis, he says very explicitly, if the world ever departs from the right angle, we will have entered the apocalypse. <laughs> well. Okay, so why was there just one angle? Why was there just one angle, one accepted angle, on which the world seemed to depend? And really, I mean, I'm among architects, people who love, it's still such a policing force in the field of architecture that it seems really like that everything is based on this. Think about it, it's a platonic idea. Plato postulated the right angle, correct? In the Timaeus. But you know, when he walked through the streets of Athens, there was not a single right angle that he could see. You know, because Athens is topo topography. You know, there's not a single, not, not even in the Parthenon. The Parthenon is curved. The, b the, the columns lean inwards. You know, it, it's, it's not, there's not a single right angle in that amazing building. So, the right angle and the freedom to discover something other. So, I had a chance to, d to, to build this important uh, building in Dusseldorf, one of the most sophisticated and beautiful cities in Germany, Kobogen, which is really two major blocks uh, at the end of the major avenue, the Königsallee, the King's Alley, right on the Hofgarten, the, the Royal Garden. And two blocks, you know, the regulations are very strict. The building has to be this, the building has to be this high. How do you find any freedom to design anything but two gigantic blocks? It's, it's very hard because it's really, you know, it dictates the zoning and the regulation dictate. They have to be two large blocks, exactly given the heights, given the orders for each elevation. So suddenly I had an inspiring moment. Le Petit Prince, the Little Prince. Now remember, in the Little Prince, uh, the snake swallows the elephant and it looks like a hat. So that's a brilliant idea, you know. A snake swallows an elephant, it looks like a hat. Things that don't go together can suddenly come together in an unexpected way. So I said, you know, I'm going to try to swallow the two blocks with my pencil. So there they are. You can see the large scale. There, this is right on the, on the Hof Garden, on the water there, on the lake. And then the building develops just through into public spaces. And you know, it's, it's, it's marble and it's glass with patterns. And I also opened the building with large green sort of openings that are read both from the inside of the building from the outside. It's really a dramatic structure following all the regulations, but really free in its geometry within 
this very strict parameter. And I think that's really what, what uh, I discovered, that within this very tight regulation, there is amazing amount of freedom if you have the right snake, the right elephant, and the right hat. So there it is. It, it's, it's really uh, has, has become really the center. It's, it has offices. It has uh, retail shops, restaurants. It's really, uh, at the end of this avenue, one of the most sort of uh, important buildings. And it has given s uh, s uh, uh, really a sign to re redevelop the areas everywhere there as well. OK, the overture. Well, I mean, you know, I was, as I said, a professional musician. Uh, so the overture, you know, you, know, you know the overture in Mozart, Magic Flute. The overture in, you know, Beethoven's Fidelio. Generally, overture is a kind of a, a, a summary of what's going to follow. Well, what is the overture in architecture? The overture in architecture is the idea. What is the idea in architecture? And this is what I really kind of illustrated with. This is a Velasquez painting, a woman playing a harpsichord. Question is. What is the idea of this painting? Now, you don't have to be a Flemish expert in history to know that this painting is not about a woman playing a harpsichord. She's playing a harpsichord, sure. The light is falling, and she's at, the, at that, uh, that cembalo. But we know that there is an idea in this painting which has nothing to do with this obvious figuration of what is it's a complex painting. Lots of ideas are happening in here, certainly. Very similar to architecture. What is the idea in architecture? It's not the building's program explicitly or what the building stands for. It's something internally, like in this Velasquez, uh, in this uh, Vermeer painting. So reflections in Keppel Bay in Singapore. Well, you know that Mies van der Rohe said that the most important thing is to have a singular idea, one idea, which can be repeated over and over again in as close as possible way. And of course, if you compare Toronto Dominion project of, of, uh, of Mies and his Chicago project, they're almost identical. Slightly different side, but they're the two towers then. Well, I always rejected this idea. I don't think it can, I an idea can be transposed in that way. Uh, here is Singapore site, right on Keppel Bay, you know, old industrial site. Uh, you know, these sites have become now more available. Industry has changed. And I was able to, in a competition with this project for housing, this is uh, uh, towers and, and lower buildings around Keppel Bay. What is the idea of the building? Well, there were two ideas, major ones. First of all, I said that the regulations are for rather low buildings. But I'm going to try to show the redevelopment agency of Singapore. And Singapore is a city state, but very advanced in many ways, that they should be really allowing much higher buildings buildings that are 50% higher than, the, than the, the zoning, because it's better, more sustainable, not to eat up all the green space. It's a small country. You know, you need to keep the green space, create buildings that are tall, highly dense, still create a, a, the, the shoreline with lower buildings, create amenities in the bridges. Then I had another idea. You know, why should people just live in extruded towers which just repeat? You can repeat plans very rationally, but you can create a tower which is doubly curved, where every floor is in a different position of space. And it really is something amazing when you're there. It's hard to explain it from a picture, but when you're on a floor, there's someone above you and below you, but not exactly where you are. And it is a different feeling. And by the way, when I proposed this to my developers, Keppel Company, they said, okay, Mr. Levitkin, that's a little bit too much for us. One curve will be enough. So I said, well, if, if you say that. that the so they w we went back, they went back to the redevelopment agency of Singapore. And the agency said, OK, to the developers, you can have the one curve, but then the buildings have be lower by 40%. Now, they were not stupid. There's much more money to be made in the tall building. So there it is, uh, a, a, a sense of creating a, a, a vital neighborhood. And by the way, as Ridley Scott just made a m movie about the future using this as his prop. But it's not the future, it's already built. You have people living there. You have, you know, you have, you have uh, you know, spectacular views. You have, and again, this is something that I'm very interested. How do you make, you know, people expect the museum to be iconic, right, or, or town hall. But housing is just housing, just like the right angle. It's, it's the banal. But I think housing is really the most important thing for people to live. And by the way, I just, I'm, I'm not only working on luxury project, I just won a competition, two competitions in New York City, one in Bedford-Stuyvesant and one in Long Island to build housing, you know, social housing, social housing in those block, tenement blocks 
uh, for older people, which really, believe me, has nothing to do with the way those blocks look. They have totally different qualities. They have different, same amount of money as those you know, brick blocks that, that, that mar so many people's lives because of their terrible idea or lack of idea about how to live. So there it is, Singapore. And I'm very proud that this was actually, believe it or not, the most profitable project of Singapore. You know, Singapore has, you know, Jean Nouvel, you know, uh, Foster, you know, the, you know, really the most famous colleagues and architects working there. So to create a project which is the most profitable is fantastic. Now I had another chance to build uh, uh, right next door almost uh, a high density project called the Corals. Again, you know, standing in water. They're very different regulations, very different sense to give everybody a view of the site, to give everybody a sense of beauty and also luxury. The labyrinth. Well, the labyrinth, you know, we live in a labyrinth. We, we, the life is a labyrinth, but labyrinth is also uh, the method. Wh what method can you use to design a building or a city? What is it? Now, we know from the story of Daedalus and Icarus, remember? Daedalus was, in the Greek ancient times, designed the labyrinth. He designed the labyrinth. But he also designed a way to get out of the labyrinth, which is the wings. And remember Icarus, one of his sons, flew just too close to the sun, and his, w his uh, wings melted, and he fell to death into the water. So that's really the sense of the labyrinth. How do we deal with a method without really falling apart? Uh, now, these three phases, w the different methods. You have Descartes, the scientific method, the coordinate axis, very rational. Reject everything you've been told. That's what Descartes says. Forget everything you've been taught. It's all a lie. Start thinking from yourself, from zero. Doubt everything. There is no truth. Doubt everything. Even doubt that there is truth. So he went very far to create a system. Brunelleschi, one of my favorite uh, you know, artists and architects, the system of perspective, which means that whatever is close to you is large. Whatever is far from you is small. It's amazing. So God is the smallest. It's the infinite point. It's a point. It doesn't almost exist. Out, it's out of this world, literally. And then we have Mendelssohn, you know, Eric Mendelssohn, the great architect of the 1920s, 30s, 40s uh, in Berlin and then in America, who really had a method of designing his building by listening to a piece of music, believe it or not. He listened to a piece of Bach and just made a gesture on his drawing and then I don't know how, but he was able to translate the gesture into large office buildings, into schools, universities. Amazing. So methods, you know, you can, m there are many methods. There's not one method. There are many, many different methods. And each m design that I do, really, you have to invent a method, the right method for this right program. Now, here is a project uh, in Germany, in Dresden, uh, a project for the Military History Museum of Germany. It's a no small topic. It is the largest museum in Germany because German military history is powerful and long and devastating as well. There is a picture of Dresden after the Allied bombings in 1945. This beautiful city, which was considered the Venice of the North, the most beautiful city in the north of Europe, was completely just vanished from, from sight. So what did I do? Here is the U-shape, that armory, and there's a vector. And I created a building which is self-similar to the triangulation of the bombings of, of, of Dresden. That's the new part of the building. So you're standing within the three bombs that started the total destruction of the city. And the the, this vector points actually at the first bomb, the two others, second and third bombs. So here is a plan of it, plan of that armory. It's, it's, it was built in 19th century soon became a military museum, then became museum of, 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 of Saxony, museum of Hitler, was Hitler's museum, museum of Stalin, the Russian, the East German museum. And after unification of Germany, the question was, what do we do? How do we go on? So you can see that this vector in which you are in that triangle uh, disrupts the old structure in a very particular point just between the chronology. The chronology goes you know, from right to left, from Teutonic Knights in 12th century all the way to you know, NATO soldiers, German soldiers in Afghanistan. Interrupts that chronology just between 1914 and 1945, exactly the militaristic years that devastated the world. Here is from the book. It's a kind of a 
uh, yes, the building, the armory, which I restored, it was poorly handled by East German architects. It was kind of dilapidated. I restored it and sort of had that that strong vector uh, traveling through it. You can see that that the building cuts through that structure, or that column structure, with a completely different structure. It's a, a concrete structure. It's leaning. It's 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 dynamic. And by the way, that running text as you enter it is from von Clausewitz. Von Clausewitz wrote the book on war, a book that I think every general in this country and every other country is reading right now, in which he said that peace is just a delay of war. It's a frightening thought, but that's, that's Prussian militarism taken to its extreme philosophical end. So again, the museum does not have really, let's say, in this new part, normal exhibits. It's more emblematic objects. There's the Dora rocket. There is, there's sort of emblematic objects that, that, you know, things that fall from the sky. And by the way, in this part of the museum, which doesn't have normal artifacts, questions are asked. The questions are the following. Why do people follow authoritarian leaders? Why do people march when they are told to march? Why do people pull out their guns when they're told to shoot? Why do they shoot? Well, no answers can be given to such questions, but the questions are posed. No answers can be given, but the questions are posed to the audiences. And you can see toys and all the things that are part of everyday life. And then at the end of this uh, journey, at the very top, you can go out of the building. That was my idea. You, you're out of the building. You're in an open structure pointed towards that first bomb. And you have the view of Dresden. You have the, you know, it's a beautiful rebuilt city, rebuilt in a kind of Baroque style. Mock Baroque, I would call it, because it's all new construction, but it looks like Baroque. And you're in the wind. You're suspended in the wind. You know, there's wind. You're, you're just suspended in front of the building. And I think that's really the idea of a military history museum. Your human being is suspended in front. The military is not behind the walls in a democracy, and Germany is a democracy. The, the, the uh, military is responsible to the civic order. Military is not an autonomous group. It's a responsibility to citizens. And so you, as an individual, are suspended in front of that building. And you're free to think, to float, to act as you think fit in a democracy so that the devastations of wars don't come to you, to us. The chess game. Well, the chess game is about strategy. You know, chess is very interesting for those of you who play. It has very few rules, yes, very few rules. You know, the knight moves, the queen, the king, the pawn, very few, but very complex outcomes. As opposed to modern technology algorithms, which have very complex rules and very, very simple outcomes. So that's the difference between chess. And this is about strategy. Every building needs a strategy to be built. So the building, the client, the budget, all this is part of a strategic thinking, how to get something done. The Jewish Museum Berlin, which in fact actually was my first building. I never built anything before, not even a small addition. So I told you I didn't work for an, any architect. I didn't work on any buildings in my whole life. And by the way, when I won this competition, quote, competition, you know, usually winning a competition is a ticket to oblivion. Don't, don't try to win a competition because nothing really happens when you win a competition. But I was with Nina actually on my way and my, our kids in Berlin on the way to, you know, to, to the paradise of Santa Monica and the Getty. And I said to her, you know, we, we stay in Berlin in order to try to build this, although nobody had any, any intent to build such a building, under one condition that you join me as my partner. That's Nina. And she said to me the words which I still remember very well. She said, how can I be your partner? In my whole life, I've never even been in an architect's office. And I said to her, the same applies to me. So we are both <laughs> in this together. <laughs> so there is, there is how I started. That the black line there, the black line is, is the Berlin Wall. You know, the, 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 the museum was built in, when the competition was in 1989, just before the fall of the wall. There it is. And by the way, when I drew that star of David connecting addresses of people, and I multiplied that matrix to sort of many, many different uh, geometries, uh, I really felt that I destroyed the wall and how strange it was. Because Jews had nothing to do with the division of Berlin. Jews were citizens o of Berlin, successful citizens, workers, people who made the city into an interesting, in important city. So there is the building. There is, there is a kind of the matrix in which I sort of married Jews and non-Jews, intermarried them. Famous one, uh, Rachel Varnhagen, 
uh, uh, Frederick Schleiermacher, Mies van der Rohe, Paul Salon, the writers, poets, theologians. And I sort of ramified this, this system into the planning of the building. Well, strategy, what is the building based on? Well, you see the music paper. I wrote it between, it's called it, I call it between the lines. It's between, between the lines of music, in the empty space of music. And you have here a portrait by Egon Schiele of Schoenberg, the great Arnold, later Aaron Schoenberg, the great composer, Viennese, came to America. Maybe you know, he's, he's famous. You should listen to his music. It's not screechy and difficult, although it's very seldom played. But, Sh but Schoenberg was a genius, and he created an opera when he was in Berlin, which he did not complete, uh, called Moses and Aaron. I, I highly recommend it. It's not often performed. It's a complex opera. He gave it up after the second, uh, second act. He, uh, and, and second act ends in an aporia, in a, in a paradox, because Moses calls to God, and there's just n silence, and then Schoenberg is exiled from Berlin. He leaves Berlin. He's, you know, he's hounded, and that's it. I thought if I build this building, I could use this building to complete an opera, to complete the, th the third act, which is unwritten musically, it cannot be written. I could complete it in the echoes of the footsteps of the visitors across the void, which runs across the whole museum. There's an emptiness. The presence of absence is the center of the museum. And of course, there are many other things that I show. Uh, Walter Benjamin, the great writer of Berlin, Einbahnstrasse, the one-way street. How do you open a one-way street? So there is the building. There is the, you know, the, the old Baroque building. There is the kind of the, the void that runs right through that building. There's a the Holocaust Tower. It's, 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 it's a piece of architecture that <coughs> is dramatic. You enter really through the old building, to into the underground. That's a very unusual way to enter a building. You don't enter the new building at all. You can only access it from the darkness. And that, that was my idea, that only through the darkness of history of Berlin, of Germany, which is during the height of its prominence, great philosophers like Hegel and Schelling and Lessing, the bigotry against Jews and against others was so powerful that the destruction of Berlin was not surprising, actually, in retrospect. By the way, the stones of Jewish cemeteries were used as of 1933 to pave the subways of Berlin. So you have to enter through the darkness, and then you enter really a different kind of space. It's, it's a totally different story. And by the way, my strategy in this building was to tell a story. You know, a building could tell a story. Now, when I said that and wanted to do it, I was excoriated by famous historians, by famous architects, by famous architectural experts, not by the public. They said, no, architecture does not tell a story. Architecture is an abstract object in space, beautiful in its proportions and so on, but nothing to do with the story. I said, no, architecture can tell a story, not in words, but in proportions, in materials, in light. Those are the, language, those are the, the, the languages of architecture. So there it is, the kind of tense relationship between two buildings that are not really connected. And by the way, this was an international competition. There were you know, 120 architects from around the world. And I was the only one who proposed no bridge between the buildings. There should be no bridge. Every, every project had a bridge, of course. That's the obvious way. Connect the Baroque, put a bridge, and you have a new building. So no, no, no bridge. There is a bridge, but only in darkness. And then, of course, in this darkness, you enter this plane, this overture, I call it, uh, which leads you to, the, to the, what I call the Holocaust Tower. It's, a, it's an emptiness. It's just a tower, 23 meters high, 24 meters high. Uh, just empty, just with a sliver of light at the end. And I have to tell you, I, for many years I worked on this project and I had no light in this tower. I thought that in the Holocaust, the dead end, there is no light in, in, in murdering people. There's nothing we can say about it. It's, it's, it's fatal darkness. It's darkness that cannot be penetrated. By then I read a uh, account of a survivor who was then in Brooklyn, a woman. She said, when I was put into those cattle, cattle cars, uh, to be taken to one of the concentration camps, Steinhoff. She said, I saw a crack of light. And she said, this is many years later, I don't know what that crack of light was. Was it a split in the wood of the, of the, of the car? Was I looking at a plume of smoke of an airplane? But I don't know what it was, but I held on to that light. And I believe I survived because of it. How interesting. So at the last moment, the building was almost finished. I put this sharp end of light into this tower. There is also, 
you know, that, that plate, that overture, it gives you also access to this garden. I call it the Garden of Exile because Berlin is exiled. Berliners were exiled, but also the city is exiled from itself. It's a different city, city of new hope. It's a symbolic garden. You know, the, the, the vegetation is high up, seven meters high. Uh, there's a system that things grow. Uh, and symbolic because this, it's seven times seven, 49 columns like that, standing at right angle to the plate of ground, which itself is tilted. So you feel really like you're on a boat. You feel many people sort of suffer from lack of balance. You know, you, 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 it's hard to stand there. Symbolic, the central column is filled with the earth of Jerusalem and the 48 are filled with the earth of Berlin. 1948, the creation of the State of Israel. And of course, the stair itself that takes you to exhibitions which are no, don't have really normal windows. They are really that, that matrix of that star that shines towards addresses that have been erased in history but are accessible. And of course, the memory void at the very end where if you stand, if you cross those bridges, and much of the building has no possibility of hanging art. You cannot hang art here because these places are not heated and not in the winter or not cooled in the summer. Uh, that was also part of my idea, that inside of the building, there's an outside of the building. And of course, authorities would ask me, why are we paying money to build something where we can't put art? But I said to them, it's important to show visitors that the key to the building is that which cannot be shown, which is the spiritual carriers of those objects and those ideas. So there it is. It's a building that certainly had, has had an impact on on the city, on the consciousness. Many of the chancellors of Germany who are, whom I've known over the years have told me that more than all the speeches they gave, more than all the political agreements that they made across the world, the building is thing that took Germany, Berlin, to a, a different steps. And th that's what I say. You know, a book can be filed away or even burned. So can a building, but it's more difficult. Uh, you can wipe memory out with a mouse, but a building is something on the street. And it brings that sense of what it is and that history and the memory really to the public. Expression. Well, expression is a, a, about building. It's a dirty word in architecture, right? You can have expression in art, but not in architecture. But I just had a very good espresso coffee. You know, espresso coffee, nobody just wants diluted coffee. I mean, maybe you do, but mostly we like having espresso, the real coffee, the essence of coffee. That's really what it is. And uh, expression, ah my favorite person, James Joyce. I think his archives are in Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken. You know, when I won this competition in Dublin, I felt I knew Dublin very well, because I've read Ulysses numerous times. And that book is really, uh, you know, as he said, it'll keep scholars busy for 1,000 years, <laughs> and then there'll be more time <laughs> to find out. So yeah, I thought, OK, I'm going to dedicate this building kind of in my own way to James Joyce. Now, what is it? It's, it's a public theater. 2,200 seats. Uh, it's a sketch. There it is on really a piece of land that was nothing at the when I started, just at the, dock, the, at the docks. Uh, you can see there's a piazza I created, a very shallow entry, making the building very economical. Again, it's, it's not a big deal to design a theater for a billion dollars, which has been designed in Hamburg. But this was 40 million. So that, that's the difference. You know, costs are very important. And to create a building with great acoustics, with elegance, with a sense of prominence. And now, of course, it's really a very popular building. It's, it's the whole area is, is thriving. It's flanked by, you can see a piece of it, two, two, two office buildings, where it was a public-private partnership. So I built two office buildings. One of them is Facebook. The other one is a big law company. And uh, just to give you a sense, that's the street. This street is called Misery Hill. So you can see what it used to be. Misery Hill, that was the poor Dublin, which is now rise, ha, has risen to a, be a fantastic city, beautiful city. There is the Grand Canal Theater. There is the office building sort of touching into the theater. There is the piazza, which is occupied every day with markets and you know, now Google and Microsoft and you know, all, all the companies and the theater has generated restaurants and hotels. And then I made my own little memorial to James Joyce. Nobody asked me. Just between the theater and the atrium, I was able, ah, the, 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 you know, the Dubliners are, are literary people, to put the ten, 10 100-letter words from, actually not from Ulysses, but from Fenegan's Wake. You know, 
he was a linguist, Joyce, so he, he thought that there were 10 words of God, thunder words, he called them, that connected all languages. And he was, you know, knew all languages. He knew everything, Swahili and Finnish and all. And he put this, these 100 letter words, and I actually was able to put them kind of backwards as if to print the words. But if you have a minute to sit there, you're overwhelmed by really the sense of where you are. Okay, Denver Art Museum, another great place in the Rocky Mountains where I was able to win a competition to design a major museum. No, sketch, you have to, you have to sketch something. As I was coming down in the airplane, I thought, you know, this is a great place. We, it's got the Rocky Mountains and it's got this beautiful city. So I called it two lines going for a walk. Really two different lines of movement that are really creating the building itself. There is the building. It's really an unprecedented building. It's a radical building. It's not a box. It's not, you know, a tame building. It's radical in every way, spatially. And it's radical not just because I am sort of believer in it, but because the, uh, the, the museum itself said to me, to me, don't give us any box. We don't, we're not interested in the old idea of art, which is contemporary art, which is installation art. It's sound, it's music, it's, it's dance. It's not just hanging paintings. And Frederick Heiner, who runs the museum, has used it in a way that is unfathomable. He, shows that cannot come to New York or Chicago or Los Angeles come to this building because they have the space. For example, like Christian Dior, a mega fashion show, which is right now, uh, you know, they wanted to have it in New York, they wanted to have it in Chicago, in LA, but no one had the space. And by the way, it has, gets about a million visitors a year in what, when I started, was called a cow town. But look, on the right is also a piece of the project. Th that's a, you know, a view from the top. Uh, you know, I was with great architects, you know, Isozaki, Tom Main, uh, many, many great architects in the competition. And we had to build, you know, there was program to build a, a car par garage, you know, park 5,000 cars, whatever it was. So everybody thought, you know, put them on the ground, great, have a nice space. But, you know, you have to calculate, if you build an underground garage, you have no money to build a building. So I said, okay, let's build a regular garage, five-story garage, but put housing around it, create, ah, there it is, across the street towards the Geoponte building, a kind of diagonal cut in the city and the piazza, again, I had support from uh, the authorities to close the street, you know, it was full of just cars. I was able to build housing. And by the way, it was interesting, this housing, which I built, the apartments that had the view of the museum were sold first for the most money. The apartments that had view of the Rockies sold last. <laughs> it shows you that people want to look at architecture. So there it is, the museum that has really a different capacity, different sense of form, different sense of uh, excitement. And it's really a museum that in many ways is not for itself, it changed the whole area. The area became the art area. There's uh, two new museums that have been built, the Clifford Stone Museum, another museum, all the galleries, uh, hotels, housing. So this area near the state capital has suddenly become a cultural center of a great city, not just an empty street you know, of, of car parking. Okay, World Trade Center. Well, that may be the most difficult project ever to even fathom what it is. You know, uh, I have to tell you, it's, there is no, so to speak, a roadmap for this project because first of all, there's not a single client. You know, wh where, who's the client? There, there's, th there is the families of the victims, number one, in the thousands. Think about it, 3,000 people or so perished, but each of them had an uncle, an aunt, a son, a, a brother, a mother, father. So those numbers are in mega thousands and thousands. The site is owned by Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, one of the largest organizations. It has about 7,000 engineers and architects. Th think about it, 7,000 engineers and architects run by the governor of two governors of powerful states, New York and New Jersey governors, are in charge of the Port Authority. The Port Authority leases the land to private developers and their own architects to boot. And of course, underneath run the path trains and subways, which are independent authorities in themselves. So take that, that's your client. Federal money as well. There's money of the federal government. So yeah, that's how are you going to do something? What are you going to do? Well, that's, that's my early sketch. It's in the book, it's a kind of pull out. And you know, I have to tell you, I was in 
won Liberty Plaza, very close to the site, with the, with the seven finalists. You know, Norman Foster, Richard Meyer, famous fr friends and colleagues. And somebody from the Port Authority said, does anybody want to go down to the site? And every architect said, no. It's much easier to see the site from the top. You can see everything. You can see the whole cleaned up site. You can see But Nina and I said, yeah, we want to go down. It was a miserable November day, you know, windy, wet, you know, the classic gray day in New York. I went down, we went down to the site, and really, I have to tell you that as I descended that ramp, that 75, m you know, feet below uh, street level, really my life changed. I, I, I experienced something that I never experienced, never thought about it. And I touched the wall, which is holding the site, that slurry wall, and the engineer said, that's the slurry wall. And even though I studied architecture, I had not a clear idea what was the slurry wall. It's a dam. It's, a, it's a, like a huge dam holding the waters, the pressure of Hudson River from flooding the entire city. And it would have had that wall collapsed. And then I created, you know, I decided never to build on, on most of the site. You know, out of the 16 acres, eight acres, I said, nobody should ever build on. But that, that's a sacred, even though it's a piece of real estate, you have to understand, nobody declared, declared this sacred site. It's a piece of real estate, and every square inch of this real estate in New York is very expensive. But I said, no, sh nothing should be built there. There should be a public space. This, the footprints, the names, the museum should be there. And then I had the towers really as far away as possible so that uh, they would be not casting shadows as, as little as possible. And 1776 Tower, which is the tower number one, that's a height, again, which will never be surpassed. Even though tower, taller towers will be built in New York, nobody will ever pass, surpass 1776 because that's the dec date of the Declaration of Independence, which is the first document of human rights. And of course, uh, the many other uh, connections underground uh, and the bedrock. So of course, it's not easy to, to do such a project. You're under tremendous scrutiny uh, there are people who want to rebuild the towers, just the old towers. There are people who want to have low-rise buildings. The, 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 let's have just low-rise buildings in a park. There are people who don't want to rebuild anything. Let's not build anything for the next 30s. Let's think about it. So you have to go into the fray. It's, it's, yeah, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And, and there it is. And, uh, you know, I illustrate what is there now, actually, the towers. Uh, tower number two is not yet constructed, but tower one, three, and four are. Footprints, the museum, the visitor center, the path terminal, the uh, performing arts center under construction. So almost, I would say, 85, 90% is, is almost here. Uh, and that's really the, the, the sense of what a master plan is. People don't really know what a master plan is. They think it's some fiction or some mental abstraction. But to think about it. It's a musical score. You know, the composer is not visible on the stage. You don't see Mozart con conducting or, you know, Schoenberg conducting. They are in invisible. They wrote the score. The score has to be very precise, geometrically, architecturally, musically. has to be given to others to interpret. Otherwise, it's a mechanical score. You have to have some freedom of interpretation. It's called maybe compromise in a democracy. And you have to be very precise to achieve the consensus of all the players. You know, if the musicians don't want to play it, nothing's going to get built, right? If the orchestra, you know, goes on strike, no performance. So consensus was the key, and I'm a great believer in democracy. Many people told me, wouldn't you like this to be in China? They would build it in three years, it would be perfect, would appear on the cover of all the magazines, you know, you'd be finished. I said, no, I, I wouldn't prefer this to be in China. I, I like it that it's in New York, it's hard. As Churchill said, democracy is the worst system, but the best of all the worst systems. No matter what it is, democracy is difficult, but it's the best of the system. So there it is. There is a slurry wall, which, which is now really sort of uh, uh, orienting the museum itself and on, on the underground. The 9-11 Museum has you know, m you know, millions of visitors. The site itself has 35 million visitors a year. It's not even complete. Uh, people like it. People like the feeling of it. And by the way, to, to expose the slurry wall is very difficult. That was one of the things that I was lucky to have support at the Port Authority engineers. Because, you know, it's a foundation. Foundation is meant to s put something on top of it so you don't see it. So, you know, but to expose a foundation is something that has never been done. We see foundations in, in old ancient cities which have collapsed. Uh, in Greece, in Rome, in, in Jerusalem, you see foundations that are open, but they are not working anymore. They are not working for the buildings. So this is a living foundation, which is a testament, really, to the, to the power 
of the world, to the power of America, to the power of liberty, to the power of strength. And it's very moving if you go ever there. And of course, the footprints with the water. And by the way, that was also in my master plan. I wanted to bring the water to the site in, in a big way. And you know, the tabloids, New York Post, and uh, on the front cover, they say, Libeskin is crazy. You don't bring Niagara Falls to New York. But you know, you need it. You need, you know, there, uh, you need it for the acoustics. Uh, you know, it's very noisy in Lower Manhattan, and to give a private experience. And if you ever there, you stand there, you can read a name. You have a sense of of, of communion, uh, a sense of sense of, of sensitivity, and of course, also bringing water to the hardscape is good. It's so much, you know, a asphalt in Lower Manhattan. So there it is, looking towards it. Uh, it's not yet finished, as I said. There are many sort of some elements still uh, not there. But it is what I intended to be, which is really an echo of liberty, an echo of what America is, really city uh, of immigrants. And I have to say this to you, that, you know, as I said, I was, uh, my parents were immigrants. Uh, what did my parents do? They were workers in sweatshops. My mother was uh, in the garment industry, sweatshops with other immigra immigrant women. My father worked in a printing shop in a very tough environment on Stone Street. And I said to myself when I was doing this project, what is this, who is this project for? My parents, 99% of New Yorkers, will not be in those wonderful towers, Condé Nast and Time Magazine. Uh, you know, they'll be on the streets. They'll be, you know, in the subways. They'll be running to feed their families. What do they get? That was my, pers my, my intent. Give them a beautiful view. Give them memory, but also something amazingly beautiful in New York, which is this sense of perspective and what New York is. And that's really what the book is about. It's really about how architecture can contribute to civic life, how it can respond in a creative way, and how one can take a path that is individual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I'm not sure Dan, you're prepared to answer them. I, I can take a few questions. Yeah. It's, um, thank you very much for your very interesting um, talk. Um, it seems that you very like a cute corner. So um, could you explain more kind of the philosophies um, when you use a lot of a cute corner? And also, um, based on that, can you have some reflection of uh, architecture should be um, harmonized with the surrounding or ruined the surrounding by some very difference like you do? Thank you. I don't know whether I understood the question completely. Uh, yeah, um, so it seems that you really like a cute corner, like... Um, ah, about geometry. Yeah, geometry, oh, yes. yeah. Oh, yes, I love, I love a cute yeah, corner. Yeah, yeah, I, yes. I really like that. Yeah. So look, <laughs> look uh, if you think about it, uh, this is what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright said, who, uh, you know, we have some great buildings here in Buffalo, Frank Lloyd. He said, if a building is not sharp, and wedge-like, it's not going to work. His mm -hmm. buildings are, even some of them who have just right angles, wedge-like and sharp. Well, look, everybody has to follow their notion of what the world is about. But I think the world is not obtuse, and it's not right. It's acute. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> so that's, that's why I want to ask regarding to acute, because kind of if I, um, the people who just see the building is very really impressive. But if I live um, opposite with the building, maybe I don't feel well when the acute go directly to me. Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. So well, you're, you're right. Uh, many projects, uh, particularly in Asia, which I do, there is the question of feng shui and you know all this mm -hmm. thing. But I'm not really believer in it at all because I think you know a lot of it is just superstition. A lot of it is you know ancient lore you know, super like astrology rather than astronomy. And I think, you know, we live in a contemporary world. We have, you know, signs. 
we have you know brain science we have uh, astrophysics we have genetics we have radical new views of the world architecture is not changing that quickly but architecture can also be contemporary as well thank you Yes, about the Freedom Tower, um, the the twin tr uh, trade towers, you know, were twins, both the same height, and you replaced them with a collection of towers with one that was most prominent and tallest. In any way at all, did you see that as kind of giving a classic New York gesture to our enemies? No, uh, well, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is, it, it, the project, you, you're right, the project is an affirmation of life over the terror of New York, absolutely. And really, if you analyze the, w you know, the two towers that were there, and I know them because my uh, brother-in-law worked in the Port Authority in those towers, and I w was in them many times, it was not the best environment. You know, it was very windy. The piazza, the plaza was closed in the winter because of the winds around the plaza. It was, there was no life in it. There was no shopping. There was no, you know, it, it was a, a building of, of its time. You know, very abstract kind of sculptures. Uh, so my idea was to t really create a neighborhood. And to tell you the truth, since I started working on this, 300,000 people have moved to Long Manhattan around the site. If, if one ever wanted to know if a project is good or not, 300,000 people moving, which means schools, housing, shopping, hotels. Let's put it this way. Lower Manhattan, around this uh, uh, the Ground Zero site, is now the center of New York, th th by, by far. There is Midtown, there is you know, Hudson Yards, there's Uptown, but for the next 30 years, there's no doubt that this is the epicenter of New York, and I like it because that's the original, that's the you know old New York, you know Chinatown, Battery Park City, Soho, uh, Tribeca, all those uh, subway lines which merge into this you know tip of Manhattan. So that was really a, 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 a very much part of the project. There was no housing required here. It was really about 10 million square feet of density of office space, five million square feet of uh, of, of infrastructure, five more million in in uh, cultural, you know, it's a mega, it's, this project, if you take the density of it, this project is larger than all of Denver. Just tr try to get this in your head, that this, you know, what you see those towers, it's larger than a downtown of a major American city. That's, that's what it is. And the fact that it looks open, that I kept the footprints of the buildings as, l as, as narrow as possible, even though people at that time wanted you know, large, have, you know, big buildings for trading floors. I said, you know, by the time the buildings are built, there won't be any trading floors because the technology will have changed. You don't need such huge uh, buildings. So there's a lot of openness, a lot of permeability. And just think about it, building number two, which has not yet been built, is still much taller than the Empire State Building. So it's, you know, it's sometimes hard to get uh, sort of the scale, but what is important is what it feels like really on the streets of New York. The feeling uh, as a pedestrian, as somebody taking the subway or the, or the train. And that's really the human scale. And that's, uh, I think, why people do love coming there. You know, there was a lot of controversy, don't get me wrong. Oh my God, there was so much controversy. I was attacked by so many people. But, uh, you know, it's not new to me. Every project I've done has been like that. So it's part of my life. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make a comment uh, or an observation, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to visit the Jewish Museum in Berlin, and of course I was quite struck, you know, by the exterior, and as an art historian I was wondering how this was going to function as a museum, and particularly um, a, a, a a history of the Jewish people and the Holocaust in Germany. He, museum fatigue is a chronic thing. And this, the Jewish Museum is dense with information. It's extremely dense, it's extremely layered. Um, there are many different types of media in it that you can interact with. But I never got museum fatigue, and I was not tired at the end. It was a very comfortable walking experience, one of the best experiences I've had in a museum. Thank you. You're welcome. And in fact, the German government has just appropriated 30 million euro 
to redo the exhibitions. They are aware, you know, that you know some problems, you know, uh, and and they ask the visitors why do they come to the building, and it's 50-50. 50% say they're interested in Jewish history, 50% say they're interested in the building, and so that's kind of what what the 50-50 is. And they decided to really modernize the exhibitions, completely go back in, in concept because they did them very quickly, and a lot of people, you know, were we were not completely satisfied. But I agree with you, the, the, the visitors. Yeah, the point I was just trying to make was that although your buildings are very radical on the outside, um, it could bring people to think, well, you know, how do these buildings function? Do they function at all? And I just, that was just one experience. Thank you. That I well, you, if you're an architect, you have to make a comfortable building, a building that people <laughs> want to come to, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. One more question, yes. Um, thank you so much. And uh, um, one thing I really appreciated about your lecture was that you um, took this opportunity to speak about current projects, but also to go through your entire, you know, kind of span across your entire career and reflect and uh, give us some insight on, you know, its beginnings as well. And so it was just nice to see that whole range of projects and ideas um, tonight. And um, in that same spirit, I just wondered if you could uh, maybe reflect, it's been now uh, just over 30 years since the deconstructivist architect show um, at the MoMA, and um, that was a point in time before you had built work, as you <laughs> <laughs> acknowledged, um, uh, before you won the competition for the, um, the Jewish Museum. And so I just wondered if you could reflect on that moment in your career, as a moment in your career, that what that meant for you, um, um, but then also uh, that the kind of label at the time, deconstructivist architecture, what that term meant, and now maybe 30 years later means for you. Thank you so much. A great question. Uh, I never liked the name deconstructivist architecture. It, it sounded to me too, you know, uh, academic, and really not true to architecture. Because architecture is always about construction. It's not about deconstruct. Now, I knew Jacques Derrida pretty well. I've uh, had many talks with him, both in public and private. And once, you know, he was kind of inventor, really, of of of, of the term. And he once said to me, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can write any text I want, and I can get a small publisher in France, in Paris, to publish it. And if not, I can put it on the internet and get the, you know, let people read it. But you, Mr. Libeskin, need a legal permission to do anything. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely true. Then you suddenly realize the difference between art, writing, and architecture, which has a legal component, a kind of policing component. You know, we are not free. When it comes to architecture, there is a law. Uh, it, we are in, the, in a political zone. So I th always thought that deconstruction was not really the best term. Now, what did it mean to me personally? Well, I was struggling to, to do something at that point. I didn't build a single building, not even a small addition to a house, uh, not even a garage, nothing really. And I never even drew a house. Uh, in fact, I tell the story in the book when I was in school, and I was in a great school, the Cooper Union in New York. Uh, one of my uh, professors, Professor Israel Sinak, who was a very famous engineer in New York of skyscrapers, uh, he died recently. He gave us a project that everybody should design a house complete with electrical, technical, all the plumbing, everything. Now, being a kind of a stupid rebel, I said, this is crazy because I'm never going to do that in my life. You know, I'm going to analyze, you know, the rebar system in the, po you know, Port Authority uh, bus station that N Nervi designed. Uh, well, it was the only time in my career that I got a D. <laughs> I got a D plus. <laughs> I got a D plus, but my mentors in the school were laughing all the time uh, about that. So, uh, you know, when that uh, letter arrived from Philip Johnson, who organized the exhibition, asking me to participate, uh, you know, I really didn't even know what it was, you know, because I, I didn't have any buildings. I scrounged up my models and my drawings that I was working on, and luckily for me, uh, it was a great exhibition with great, you know, people, great architects who subsequently did a lot of very important work. Uh, I think it helped me uh, to to position that work at that time. And Philip Johnson, I remember standing at uh, uh, with him at his penthouse, and. Philip Johnson, you know, spoke a fluent German. He was an intellectual. All the things in his house, in this penthouse, 
were, you know, all the Rothkos. He was the first one to buy a Rothko. All the Giacometti's. He was the first one to buy Giacometti. You know, he was the first one to, you know, he, the, the, uh, the Philip Johnson collection is, as we know, is one of the greatest collections in the world. But he stood at the window, and we were looking, and you could see the AT&T building, which he designed. And he looked at me laughing, and he said, you know, tomorrow the world is going to change after this exhibition is opened. I, they're gonna s the architecture is going to change in a moment. And it is definitely true that uh, history doesn't change gradually. It changes suddenly with, with an act, with, with, you know, wh whatever that thing is. It's not a gradual change, it's a sudden change. And I think the world did change globally. Uh, the architecture took a different turn. Maybe it was just part of, you know, uh, uh, what was happening and somebody gave it a, a signal. And by the way, that was the first exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art of architecture, which was on the ground floor. It was not on the fifth floor with the design. It was where everybody entered the museum. So, you know, the, the mass of the public, like the International Style Exhibition back in the late 20s. So it was a great moment. And uh, whatever one thinks of Philip Johnson, he was an amazing, you know, powerful m mind to, to, to do things culturally. And uh, the rest is sort of, yeah, the rest is the rest. Thank you.